Let's roll. We are jumping into the middle of chapter 14. On the table there in front of you is the handout for the rest of the book. Just to help you as you read it, to help you just focus on what are the facts of the book itself as we go through it here in this class. So again, it's just an opportunity for you to spend a little time reading and, and answering some questions to help you grasp what's going on. Let's go to God in prayer and we'll jump into this chapter. God, we thank you for all that you do for us. We thank you for it tonight. We thank you for each one that's here. Father, again, we just pray that you're guiding us, your spirit's leading us as we delve into this book of Revelation as it's revealed to us what you want us to know about it. I thank you for the guidance you're giving me and all of us in this class. Pray that you would continue to help us with this. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to read something to you before we jump into 14. This is a book, if you want a book that sort of covers the way I see the book of Revelation, this is the book. It's called The Lamb and His Enemies, written by Rubel Shelley, S-H-E-L-L-Y. Very good book covers a real good idea of, of how people who do not see Revelation as an end time story, how they see it and how they get there and, and, and what it means to them. Now, this is one of the books I've read. I was talking to somebody the other day. I ordered three more books the last couple of weeks on the book of Revelation simply because I want to keep reading and trying to make sure that what I'm trying to teach makes sense. But I wanted to read a little part out of this book it has to do with chapter 14 because I think it really sets the stage for the rest of the story. It says, God will not allow his righteous cause to be defeated by Satan. Isn't that nice to know? No matter how hard he tries, no matter how hard he fights, he's not going to win this. Although they may suffer persecution, they will not be destroyed. Although they may have to die for their faith, the eternal life that has been given them as God's free gift, will not be taken away from them. This is the message of the book of Revelation in a nutshell. That's our, that's our thought, right? If you're on God's side, we win. Yet this message is not presented in so bland and prosaic a fashion as the paragraph above. Revelation presents that message in a very beautiful, very dramatic series of apocalyptic figures. Under the symbolism of a great struggle going on in the cosmos between the Lamb and his followers on the one side and the dragon and his allies on the other, it captivates the imagination and holds the reader's attention. As the struggle is presented in the apocalypse, God assures his people as to its ultimate outcome. The purpose of doing so is obvious. He was encouraging the persecuted and discouraged Christians who received the letter originally to stand firm and not lose heart. It is as if he were saying, don't give up. Don't think for one moment about giving in to the pressures being brought against you by bowing the knee to Caesar, by proclaiming him Lord, or by compromising your integrity as a Christian. Endure, be steadfast. The victory belongs to the Lamb and those who follow him. One of the chapters of Revelation designed most directly to call attention to the victory that belongs to the Lamb and his followers is the 14th. In summary, chapter 12 shows that Satan could not defeat the Christ of God. Chapter 13 showed who would help Satan in his mission of opposing the work of God in the world. Now chapter 14 will show the triumph which the Lamb and his allies will share over the dragon and his cohorts. This section of Revelation is filled with confidence and hope. It is exciting to read and faith building to study. I hope that's true for you. I hope as we're going through this book that your faith is being strengthened and that you're coming to realize that no matter how hard Satan fights against you, no matter what's going on in this world, no matter how corrupt we may think people ruling this world are, they're not going to win. We are the victors. We've got God's assurance that if we stick with him, our ultimate outcome is more than we can even imagine. 
heaven is going to be a wonderful place. And John describes it in ways that makes us realize just how gorgeous and great it's going to be. I've said several times, I don't believe for a minute the streets in heaven are paved with gold. We're going to be spiritual beings. We don't need roads to walk on. But as John's trying to describe for us how precious heaven must be, what better way than to say the most precious measure we have is road pavement. I mean, that's just the idea. And then he goes on to describe later the walls covered in stones and, and all the other things that he talks about, and all the scenes that he opens up for us. He's doing his best through God's spirit to help us understand as best we can how glorious heaven's going to be. And that's where we're going to spend eternity. So we've got something to look forward to. If you remember last week, we got into chapter 14, and we talked about the, the three angels who showed up. And if you remember, the first one shows up and proclaims to the world. Remember, we're looking now at God's judgment is about to fall onto Rome. Those who are opposing his people are about to have the question answered, how long are we going to have to put up with this? When are you going to punish these people for doing these things to us? We're about to see that open up. So the first angel flies over the world and gives the warning. Fear God and give him glory, because the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. Notice, even though we've already been told the dragon, the beast, and the second beast are all fighting against God. God gives them one more chance. We're looking at their destruction, but they get one more chance. Before God release, releases his final wrath, he gives them one more opportunity. So the idea is the angel flies across the world telling everybody, worship God. Give it to him, not Caesar. And then the second angel comes, and he's proclaiming fallen, fallen in Babylon. Now, it hadn't fallen yet, but it was so clear that it was going to that this angel is speaking as though it already has. Because Rome doesn't have a chance. It cannot withstand what's going to happen to it. Because it's God's plan that's being unfurled over them because of their persecution and their crucifixion of Jesus. Same way we've seen Babylon of old. Same way we saw Assyria. Same way we saw all those other nations who fought against God's people in the Old Testament. God punished them because of what they had done. We see here unfolding the same story. This nation is fighting against God. It's rebelling against God's people. It killed the Messiah. And God's making it clear it is not going to get away with it. And ultimately, they're going to pay the price. Third angel flies through. He gives a similar proclamation. Not only is Babylon going to fall, but if you go along with them, if you worship the beast, if you take the mark, then you too are going to suffer the consequences. The wrath of God is going to fall on you if you give in to the bad guy. So the encouragement here, obviously, is don't do that, right? Don't give in. Don't take the salvation you have and throw it away. Because the consequence for worshiping Caesar and for not remaining faithful to Jesus Christ is you're ultimately going to suffer the same consequence as Rome's going to suffer. Questions about any of this? Notice then, and we've seen this warning several times already, haven't we? Verse 12, this calls for patient endurance on the part of the people of God who keep his commands and remain faithful to Jesus. And that's a message for us, isn't it? <coughs> we need to be patient. We need to endure. We need to not give up. We need to keep God's commandments. We need to remain faithful to Jesus. The message to the people living in John's day is the same message to us. Don't give up. Hang in there. Because ultimately, the victory is yours. 
So what happens next in this chapter? Reaping going on. Say it again. It's reaping. The reaping is going on. We're about to see a harvesting. And I mentioned last week, I think maybe the week before, we're going to watch a, a cycle of the same thing happening over the next few chapters. And I suggested that it'll be clear that that's what we're seeing as you go through the next few chapters, because here in chapter 14, the earth is harvesting. Everybody is <clears throat> reaped. And yet in 15, you got the same problem. In 16, you got the same problem. There are still people on earth. They're still suffering consequences. They're still getting the wrath of God. So 14 is not the final judgment. It is not the final end of things. It's God's way of saying, ultimately, those of you who oppose me are going to suffer the consequences. And again, we see that in 15. We'll see it in 16 as God repeats this message over and over until we get to the end of the book. So Jesus harvests the earth. He's the first harvester. And we know that, I suggest, because of what we've already seen in Daniel. Remember, chapter 14 says, here's one like the Son of Man on a cloud. Daniel chapter 7, in my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like a Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. Is this where they get the rapture thing at? Say that again? Is this where they get the rapture thing at? This is part of where they get the rapture thing at. They really get the rapture thing at, Donnie, by just saying it happened and that's it. Because they believe the rapture happens after chapter 3. If you listen, end times teachers primarily will say, after chapter 3, the rapture occurs and the church is no longer on the earth. If you're reading the book, you know good and well that's not true. The church is still on the earth. People are still being persecuted. People are still dying. Now the answer to that from some who believe that this is all end time stuff waiting for it to happen is that well other people came to believe after the rapture occurs and the church is gone, they're still teaching on earth and people turn to Christ then and that's who these people are. These are people who become Christians after the rapture. I read the 13 here where it said, it, uh, Then I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, right, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yeah, so they're still dying, aren't they? They're, they're still Christians on the earth who are dying. And obviously if John's writing this in the first century, and it's more about Rome and those who persecuted his church then than it is some end time time, there are still people dying. There will so, continue to be people dying. So did this did this take care of uh, the reaping? Take care of everybody who had lived from the beginning of time until now? That's, or, I mean, think, think of this. Remember what we've taught. Then Rob will get to you. Revelation is symbolic. Okay? Right? Have we hammered that hard enough? Revelation is symbolic. Very few things in it are literal. Jesus doesn't really take a sickle. Anybody ever swung a sickle? You have? Okay. I never have. But he doesn't really take a sickle and go down to the earth and start sweeping people up. Right? We can understand that, can we not? This is a symbolic mention that God's going to come and take care of his own. Now, some people will take chapter 14 and they see two harvest. Number one is Jesus taking his own people, and then this, the next angel shows up and takes all the bad people. I submit this is all one big story. That what John is trying to say is that God's in control of this. Notice it's the Son of Man who shows up and starts the harvesting. He's in charge of all these things. If we've learned anything in the first 13 chapters, who's in control of all this? Yeah, Jesus or God, man's not in control, right? Even though Rome would say, we're the power. You do what we say or you pay the price. We're going to control your life. Rome would say to these early Christians and to the rest of the people of the Roman Empire, we are the ones you have to listen to. We have all the authority. 
The book of Revelation makes it clear they have no authority other than what God allows them to have. And so now as we come close to the end where John is saying you're about to see the final result of what's going to happen to Rome. By the way, Peter in 1 Peter chapter 5, the end of his first book, references Rome as Babylon. Another reference in the New Testament where Rome is identified as Babylon. Why would it be identified as Babylon instead of Rome? Code word. Code word. Absolutely code word. Could you imagine if John wrote this and made it clear that it's the Roman Empire that's going to die? All you Caesars are going to die. You guys are going to reap the, the hell. You know, God's going to get you like crazy. You guys have had it. They would have really come after the church. They would have persecuted it even more. And so the symbolism that we see, part of it is code. Part of it is so that the Christians know what's happening to them and who we're talking about. And we'll see in a couple of chapters down the road here, they will talk about the city with seven hills. That's getting pretty close to saying we're talking about Rome specifically. Rob? Going back to the, those teachers who teach the rapture and then that the church is already in heaven, who are the people being persecuted after that? Who's teaching them? Well, that's the question, isn't it? If there's nobody left because all the Christians are gone, who's making more Christians? There are nobody, there's nobody left. Now, in their defense, they will say the people who become Christians after the rapture are those who saw the rapture and said, oops, we were wrong. We should have believed in Jesus. And so some of them will convert to Christianity. Now, the problem with that is there is there's no church. Right? If the rapture has happened and there is no church, who are these people associated with? How are they growing in their faith? What's going on with them to become Christians? Why would they even care? Why would they even know if all the church is gone? Why does the world continue? I mean, it, and, and again, if you study the end times ideal, the rapture happens after chapter 3. You can't find anything in the gap between chapter 3 and chapter 4 that says anything about a rapture. I mean, we don't even get to the harvesting until chapter 14. Well, why does it wait so long if it all happened after chapter 3? Who are these people harvesting? It, I mean, it doesn't make any sense to me if you study the end time ideas how they have to come up with pulling something out of the air. Because it doesn't make any sense if we take it the way it's generally taught and you study the book of Revelation. It just doesn't make any sense. But if we're watching the church being told and those who are being persecuted being told, ultimately you win. God's got a plan for what's going to happen. So you Christians who are on the earth, let me tell you, these bad guys are going to be harvested. They're going to pay the price. They're not going to win ultimately so don't give up don't quit right and so god starts the harvesting he's starting the plan to say the time has come for you people to pay the price you're going to pay the consequences for number one killing my son and number two persecuting my church you're going to get yours just like all those other nations did that we read about in the old testament and then we get another angel who shows up, and he's told to gather up grapes. Notice what he says. A third angel followed them, and in a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast and its image and receives its mark on their forehead or on their hand, they too will drink the wine of God's fury, which has been poured full strength into the cup of his wrath. And then we get to verse 20 at the end of the chapter, it says they were trampled in the wine press outside the city and blood flowed out of the press rising as high as a horse's bridles for a distance of 1600 stadia. Now some of your translations may say some other word, but the idea is there's a whole bunch of people dying, right? A whole bunch of people are going to be dead. Most people who read this suggest it's probably not literal. Where does John get this idea from then 
besides the Holy Spirit giving it to him, what would the Jews of the days of John have thought when they read verse 20 of chapter 14? Anybody know? Well, they always mix their wine with water. They dilute it, that is true. But how would they know what he's talking about here? Remember, if, if I'm correct, and again, it's open to debate, John's writing in 95 AD, roughly. When was Jerusalem destroyed? 70 AD, the temple burned. Rome comes in and conquers the city. But remember, and this is something nobody ever talks about if you listen to end time stuff. <coughs> Jerusalem's really not destroyed. It's conquered, but it's not destroyed until about 132. So some, what, 52 years later. That's when the Romans come back because the Jews rebel again. Well, it's the same question of who's on the earth if the rapture happens after chapter 3. We well, have to ask yourself, who's rebelling in Jerusalem in 130 A.D. if Rome's already killed everybody? Well, they don't kill everybody. They destroy the temple, and then they stop killing the Jews. And the Jews are then able to rebuild their nation to some extent. They don't rebuild the temple. They don't get the glory or any of that. But they still have a country. And the people who were there, slowly but surely, start gaining strength and decide, again, we're going to destroy Rome. We're going to throw them off. And these crazy people decide, we can defeat Rome now, although they couldn't do it in 70 AD. What made them think they could do it in 128, when I think the rebellion started, it staggers the imagination. Except... They do, and they rebel again. They capture some Roman garrisons, and Rome finally decides, we've had it with you. And they come and wipe the city out. We mentioned before, they plow the city under. There is no city left after 132 AD. But if you're living in 95, you're aware of what happened in 70, right? You know how many people died. Here's what Josephus wrote. Who's Josephus? Anybody know? He's a secular Jewish. historian. Okay. He's a Jewish, Jewish secular Jewish. historian. He's a Jew who was fighting on the side of the Jews before Rome attacked and then switched sides. And he becomes a historian and he writes the annals of the Jewish war. So he's somebody that people today look back to because he's living through this and he writes about it. Rome's hired him, so you've got to take what he says with a grain of salt because he's writing for Rome. Here's what he wrote about the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. But although they had this commiseration for such as were destroyed in that manner, what he's talking about is when Rome comes into the city, many people have been burned alive. They've got themselves or they've starved to death. And Rome, the soldiers come in and find hundreds and thousands of dead Jews. That's the commiseration that Josephus is writing about. When they come into the city, they're commiserating about those who have been destroyed in that manner. They're sorry for what happened to them. Yet, they did not have the same for those who were still alive. In other words, they're sorry these people had to starve to death and burn to death and all this kind of stuff, but they don't have any sorry for the people who are still there, the Jews who are still fighting. But they ran everyone through who they met. In other words, they killed every one of them. They're killing all the Jews in the city. Now, they don't kill them all, but they're killing many of them, and they're just going through the city, wiping them out. So they run through everyone who they meet with and obstructed the very lanes with their dead bodies and made the whole city run down with blood to such a degree indeed that the fire of many of the houses was quenched with these men's blood. That's Josephus' description of how many people in Jerusalem died, that so much blood is flowing through the streets that the houses that were on fire, the fires went out because so much blood is flowing through the streets. Some suggest he's exaggerating a lot. But again, remember, he's writing for Rome.
where there isn't any question, many, many Jews died. How many of you heard of the book of Enoch? It's mentioned in the book of Jude, absolutely. It is a book that still exists, and you can get online, you can read the book. Here's, and it was in existence during this time span, because Jude references it as he writes the book of Jude. So the Jews knew about the book of Enoch. Here's what the book of Enoch says. The horse should walk through the blood of sinners up to his chest, and the chariot shall sink down up to its top. In those days the angels shall descend into the secret place. They'll gather together into one place all those who gave aid to sin. Does that not sound like what John's writing about? Blood to the horse's bridles? Exactly what the book of Enoch says happened way back then. So as John's writing this, it's being written in a way that the people reading it can understand what on earth are you talking about. And the idea is there's a major disaster. And so John, through the Holy Spirit, is incorporating these disasters that the Jews would have known about. And he's bringing it into his story. I'm trying to think just off my head just now of something you and I might think about. You know, it would be like this tsunami of, you know, several years ago. Remember that tsunami that goes sweeping through up against the coast of Africa? We might say, you know, that the smoke billowed through like the tsunami did. We would all understand what we're talking about. <coughs> Rosalind's talking about, has been talking about with me, the fires that are going on in California and the billowing smoke that has gone all the way across the country to the East Coast by now. And you can imagine, if you were able to see that, if we lived up north and were in that smoke pattern, you might say something like, you know, the smoke drowned out the sun. Uh, just like the day Christ died. We understand those kinds of analogies. That's what I submit John is doing, and that God is doing through John, as he's writing about what's about to happen to the bad guys, because they understand what happened to the bad guys before. They understand the destruction that happened before. Notice also it says they're treading the wine press. The Old Testament is full of references to the wine press being God's destruction and God's punishment on people. Let me just read a few of those because I think it's important that as we read chapter 14 and we see all the destruction that's happening, what John is saying through the power of the Holy Spirit is when God decides to punish the bad guys, it's going to be monumental proportion. They're going to pay the price. And he alludes to things that they would have been aware of. Paul? You can kind of look at the thing in fact, when they took the last meal, Christ picked up the, you know, the wine, which was made out of grape. Mm -hmm. And so basically he said the same thing, but he, you know, he said, this is my blood for repenting and so on, but uh, it, it's his blood. And then it talked about the, the wine, you know, the, 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 the pressed on, you know, not pressed, but the grape being pressed. Yep. It's going to be blood, so it's, it's Christ's blood. Sure, and, 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 and of course the we believe that's symbolic, right, most of us? That Jesus is saying, this, whatever's in that cup, which is another argument, just, Jesus says, take this cup and drink it. How many of you have ever drank a cup? No, you haven't. You don't drink cups. You drink the stuff that's in the cup, right? We all use that kind of terminology, and we all know what we're talking about. We know good and well Jesus wasn't saying, take that cup and drink it. He's saying, take the cup and drink whatever's in it. We can understand that. And so when he says, this represents my blood, he isn't saying my blood's in this cup, right? He's saying this juice that's in it is a representation of my blood that I'm going to shed for you. Now, the Catholics believe the Lord's Supper actually turns into the body and blood of Jesus Christ. And as you participate in Holy Communion, if you were Catholic, that it actually turns into, I think that's called transubstantiation, big long word, mm -hmm. that basically means communion turns into the literal blood and the literal body of Jesus Christ as you take it. I don't personally think that happens. I think it's symbolic, similar to the way the book of Revelation is full of symbolism. Here's what Joel says. 
Let the nations be roused. Joel is writing about God's enemies who are going to pay the price. Ultimately, these people who are persecuting the Jews are going to pay the price. Let the nations be roused and advance to the valley of Jehoshaphat. For there I will set down to judge all the nations on every side. Swing the sickle. Huh. Sounds like Revelation 14. Swing the sickle for the harvest is ripe. Come trample the grapes for the wine press is full and the wine vats overflow because their wickedness is great. Exactly what John's describing, I submit to us, in chapter 14 of Revelation. We're not literally talking about wine. We're talking symbolically that there's going to be so much blood shed, it's going to be like wine coming out of the wine press. Here's Isaiah 63. I have trodden the wine press alone. From the nations no one was with me. I trampled them in my anger and trod them down in my wrath. Boy, does that sound like four, chapter 14 of Revelation. The wrath of God is about to be unveiled on Rome and the people fighting against God's people. And the people reading that would understand that completely. I trampled them in my anger and trod them down in my wrath. Their blood splattered my garments and I stained all my clothing. It was for me the day of vengeance. The year for me to redeem had come. I looked, but there was no one to help. I was appalled that no one gave support. So my own arm achieved salvation for me. My own wrath sustained me. I trampled the nations in my anger. In my wrath, I made them drunk and poured their blood onto the ground. Here's Zephaniah, chapter 1. The great day of the Lord is near, near and coming quickly. The cry on the day of the Lord is bitter. The mighty warriors shouts his battle cry. That day will be a day of wrath, a day of distress. Zephaniah is not writing about the end times. He's writing about God punishing those who are against him. It will be a day of distress and anguish, a day of trouble and ruin, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and dark blackness. Do you get the point? It's going to be a bad day. You're not going to want to be on the receiving end of what God's about to do. A day of trumpet and battle cry against the fortified cities and against the corner towers. I will bring such distress on all the people that they will grope about like they are blind because they have sinned against the Lord. Their blood will be poured out like dust and their entrails like dung. Not a nice thing to think about. Here's Isaiah 34. The Lord is angry with all the nations. His wrath is on all their armies. He will de totally destroy them. He will give them over to slaughter. Their slain will be thrown out. Their body, dead bodies will stink. The mountains will be soaked with their blood. Here's Ezekiel 32. I will throw you on the land and hurl you on the open field. I will let all the birds of the sky settle on you, and all the animals of the wild gorge themselves will gorge themselves on you. I will spread your flesh on the mountains and fill the valleys with your remains. I will drench the land with your flowing blood all the way to the mountains and the ravines will be filled with your flesh. Here Ezekiel's talking about what was going to happen to Egypt. Even though they're in captivity in Babylon, Ezekiel's prophesying against Egypt. Here's Jeremiah 25. Jeremiah's writing, while well, Babylon has already conquered some of the Jews, He's in that in-between time as groups are being taken away. They themselves will be enslaved by many nations and great kings. I will repay them according to their deeds and the work of their hands. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, said to me. Take from my hand this cup filled with the wine of my wrath and make all the nations to whom I send you drink it. When they drink it, they will stagger and go mad because of the sword I will send among them. Now prophesy all these words against them and say to them, The Lord will roar from on high. He will thunder from his holy dwelling. We've heard thunder, right? Cracks of lightning, the roaring that John mentions over and over that comes out of the throne of God. He will shout like those who tread the grapes. Shout against all who live on the earth. The tumult will resound to the ends of the earth. For the Lord will bring charges against the nations. He will bring judgment on all mankind and put the wicked to the sword, declares the Lord. At that time, those slain by the Lord will be everywhere, from one end of the earth to the other. They will not be mourned or gathered up or buried. 
they will be like dung lying on the ground. Again, the idea is when God's wrath finally falls, you don't want to be on the receiving end of that. God's going to make nations pay who have rebelled against him. Here's Lamentations. The Lord has rejected all the mighty men in my midst. He summoned an army against me to crush my young warriors like grapes in a wine press. The Lord has trampled the virgin daughter of Judah. Here he's talking about Judah being punished, God's people being punished because they've rebelled against him. And we know that's why Babylon comes. God raises Babylon up to destroy Judah because they suffered idolatry. They didn't worship God the way they were supposed to. Notice all of this happens outside the gate in John's story. Why outside the gate? Where was Jesus crucified? Outside, outside the gate, remember? That's where the enemies died. That's where punishment was delivered. If you were going to crucify people, you didn't do it in the middle of Jerusalem. They had a spot outside the gate. And you took the people out there and crucified them. The same imagery John is talking about. God's going to punish these people outside the gate, outside his city, outside wherever he is. These people are going to be punished out there away from God, not inside the city where you might think they were going to be. I don't think there's any question. John's describing in terms that the people reading this would understand that when God finally makes Rome pay, it's going to be just like he did in the days of old through the Old Testament. And he uses the exact same imagery and analogy of their blood flowing out like wine, like the pressing of the grapes. You know, in those days, they had a big bat, and some of you know, they, they got in there and stepped on it, they walked on it, and, and the wine, the juice of the grapes, flowed through the bottom, and they collected it. But it flows out looking like blood. And so Jesus, through John's writing here, is saying, I'm going to get revenge on those who were against me. The cry of the people under the, the altar. How long do we have to put up with this? When are you going to make these people pay? Jesus is saying the time's coming. And now he's going to go through and describe how that destruction's going to be. It's going to be total. It's going to be terrible. Every person who fights against God is going to suffer the consequences. And so as we get into chapter 14, we see the beginning of the end for those who God is against, those who are against him, those who are fighting against his people. Remember the imagery, the dragon's got his army and the lamb's got his. And the battle's going on. It's a cosmic battle. But there are consequences to those of us down here. We get caught up in that. And we suffer consequences sometimes. Just like these Christians living in John's days, we're being killed. Being persecuted doesn't mean you get the easy life just because you follow Jesus. Sometimes you get caught up in the bad things. But the point is, the 144,000 that we've seen, God's people are marked by God. He knows who you are. He's going to protect you. Not from harm, but for, from destruction. We don't suffer at the wrath of God. We may suffer, we may have some tough times, we may actually even be killed for our faith, like these people were, but that's not the wrath of God. And the end result, the reason we can stand is because we know where we're going, right? It's just, this book should just fill you with overwhelming joy to know that no matter what happens in this world, there I say it, no matter who wins in November, <laughs> we have a home. Amen. We are secured with God forever. It doesn't matter who rules in Washington any more than it mattered who ruled in Rome. God's got this. And if we'll trust him, and we'll remain faithful, and we'll have that patient endurance, we'll be okay. Right? <clears throat> Questions, thoughts? Observations. Anybody? 
the uh, wine press is uh, pretty, it really sticks in your head. It's pretty graphic. You know, you, I, I mean, you, you think of it, you know, popping like a grape. He's going to pop like a yeah. grape. It won't be any stronger than a grape in every yeah. time. It's, 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 it's so bright, and then the red, the red light. It, it's, you know, yeah, it kind of freaks me out a little bit. I don't want to be in that. You don't want to be in that. You know, so, yeah, he really drives the point home with some, some of those images and stuff that he lays yep. out there. Remember the warning to God's people is, don't give up. Be patient. Continue to keep God's command. Don't lose your faithfulness in Jesus. Hang in there. Because I'm about to show you what's going to happen to people who don't. These are those, the beast, and those who take the mark of the beast. Those who worship him. That's what, this is what's going to happen. And this should encourage every one of us not to give up. I don't want to be in this. I don't want God's wrath falling on me. I don't want to be suffering what he says his enemies are going to suffer. That should encourage every one of us when we have the choice to make to choose God's way. Because we don't want this. Now tell me the song I'm thinking about that goes along with this. Absolutely. Way to go, Rosalind. <laughs> My eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is tramping out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. He has loosed his so faithful lightning of his terrible swift sword. His truth is marching on. You want to know where she got this from? Right here. Yeah. Revelation chapter 14. God will crush people who are against him. God will fight for those who are for him. And if you're on your, his side, you win. Isn't that nice to know? All right, that's all I want to do tonight. I want to just finish 14 because next week we don't meet. Next week we have our prayer and our meal, and if you want to come pray with us, please do. I think we're going to cater the barbecue like we did last time, and we'll meet at 530. We'll have some things to pray about. It'll be an open prayer like it was last time. We can pray by yourself. It's not a collective thing. Or you can get two or three people around if you want to do that. We'll pray for a while, and then we'll come back here and just eat. And so I didn't want to start chapter 15 and then take a gap. So we'll pick up with 15 two weeks from tonight, and you get off a little early today. All right? So do you. Huh? So do I. That's exactly right. So do I. I will, Sarah, just to take up some of the time so people won't think, well, you've been all those other times that you get out early. I got some of my lab results back today. Uh, I've got something growing on my kidney, on one of my kidneys. And I've been talking to the urologist and the radio radiologist. They both said uh, it does not appear to be anything to worry about, nothing that they want to mess with. Uh, and so they said, as far as the staph infection is concerned, we think it's just something that you picked up from somewhere. We think it'll go away. And so they don't want to treat it. Uh, they just said if, if you start getting symptoms and things from it, then call us and we'll give you some antibiotics. But it appears as though it's weakening already, and uh, they're thinking it'll just flush itself out, so to speak, and I'll be okay. So we have a thing going on. So, and I do have to go and do more tests just to check out some more things. But the results today were very good, very positive. So I'm thankful. Shelly, you want to say something? No, I was going to say amen. Oh, thank you. Yes, amen is absolutely correct. That's awesome. um, so that's me. That's what's happening with me. I'm glad to hear that. Sadly, I got the report first before I heard from the urologist. Oh. And reading on it, you've got these growths on your kidney. And you get, you know, <laughs> One out of three. Like, this doesn't sound very good. And so, they then called and said, let's talk to you about that report. And I said, thank you very much. Uh, they said, it's nothing to worry about. It's nothing serious. It's not requiring any surgery at this time. Um, we're just going to watch you and keep giving you tests and see what happens. So I thought that was good. And I'm thankful for that. So were well, you feeling any I had a tough day today. I didn't work much today because my heart was playing. This has nothing to do with that. 
in my heart with acting weird today. And I'm still tired. Yeah. The staph infection is still making me tired and I don't have a whole lot of energy. But I don't have time for that. <laughs> So I'm going to do what i got to do and just right. move on, right? right? Okay, let's pray and we'll go home. God, you are an awesome God, and I thank you for this class and as we study and try to make heads or tails of, of the book of Revelation, I just pray, God, that we're headed down the right direction and that you are revealing to us the things we need to know primarily to encourage us never to give up and that we who are your children will remain faithful to you because you're faithful to us. And that no matter what happens in this world and what we see and what we get frustrated with, that we'll realize, God, that you are in control. Sometimes it doesn't make any sense to us. But I want to trust you and I want to believe in you and I pray that everyone in this class does that. And we remain faithful to you and don't give up no matter what. Thank you for this book that gives us the assurance that you are faithful. <clears throat> And if we stay on your side, we win. Thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you, everybody. Take your homework with you. That's the last.